atheist Penn Gillette, ladies and gentlemen, of Penn and Teller. I know you probably know who Penn Gillette is. Brilliant musician, musician, brilliant magician. He might be a magician, a, a musician too. I don't know. Uh, but he's also an atheist. And here's what Penn at one point said. He said, the fastest way to become an atheist is to read the Bible. I mean, what happens when you read the Bible? I mean, you really look at it. There are things in the Bible. Most of this is in the Old Testament, but some of it's in the New uh, about killing all the Canaanites or slavery. That appears to be countenanced in the Bible, like slavery is OK. Uh, there's there's polygamy. There's concubines. There's, of course, all sorts of different crimes that appear to go on in the Bible. In the New Testament, you have Paul apparently telling people, hey, women, be silent in the church. You want to you want to say something? You just ask your husbands at home. Well, when you read all that, you go, why would I want to be part of a religion that seems to be pro-slavery, anti-women, God killing people seemingly almost indiscriminately? I mean, the Bible seems to have a lot of moral problems with it. So why should I be a believer in a God like that? Why should I even believe the Bible? Well, one of the reasons you ought to believe it is because you might not know how to read it. And my friend Dan Kimball has put out this fabulous book called How Not to Read the Bible, Making Sense of Anti-Women, Anti-Science, Pro-Violence, Pro-Slavery, and Other Crazy-Sounding Parts of Scripture. Dan is a pastor out in Santa Cruz, California. He's also a member of the faculty at Western Seminary. And best of all, he's from New Jersey. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, coming all the way from Santa Cruz, the great Dan Kimball. Dan, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. And uh, again, as we keep saying, we're fellow New Jersey born and raised, and I'm glad we were born and raised there. And we escaped. We're out. Yes, You're in California. And we escaped. In North, yep. and we escaped I'm in North but, Carolina. All right. Well, there's you know, many famous people are from uh, New Jersey, besides Bruce Springsteen, Bon, bon, uh, bon Jovi. Uh -huh. but then you have Frank, Frank Sinatra, John Travolta, uh, Tom Cruise. Coming in, coming in, coming in now in three... So one, you're in, guys. Hey, we're in. Can you guys right. out there on the stream see us? If you can, put something in the YouTube chat. That's what I'm looking at right now. Uh, maybe we're back. Yeah. Hey, finally, are you guys with us now? It looks like it's working. Sorry, this is live internet. Sometimes things go down. We're back. My name is Frank Turek. We're talking to the great Dan Kimball about this new book, How Not to Read the Bible. And the reason we're talking about it is because, as atheist Penn Gillette said, the fastest way to become an, an atheist is to read the Bible. Because you read so many verses, if you just take them at face value, it appears to be pro-slavery, anti-women, pro-violence. Why would you be part of a faith that believes in those things? And Dan has written this fabulous new book, How Not to Read the Bible, we're going to go through some of the verses that are often taken out of context to try and say that the Bible's wrong or immoral or God doesn't exist. And Dan has done a great job of putting together a book that can help you do that. Uh, Dan, you grew up in New Jersey, as I did. But now you're in California. You're a pastor there. You're a, a professor at Western Seminary. Why did you decide to write this book? Yeah, this book came out of many, many conversations with especially younger people that were asking questions about uh, the more they started looking into the Bible as young adults, you know, post their youth group, family and church years, they get into adult years and start critically examining like the whole Bible or doing studies on their own and then discovering things they often didn't know was in there before. And all of a sudden, the flood of questions come. I didn't realize all the verses about slavery or, or women being silent and all of these things. So it was catching uh, Christians off guard. That was one reason, and hearing about it a lot. And then from those that aren't Christians yet, when you start looking at the Bible from the outside, I don't blame uh, Penn Gillette of what he says, but every one of his criticisms you can respond to. You know, that's the, that's the wonderful part and the hopeful part is I can understand what it's like looking in at the Bible from the outside, and it does, it would be a scary sort of book if you didn't understand how it was written, who it was written to, and all the things that we'll talk about. 
Hey, Dan, why is it important to put our self in the position, if we're reading, say, the Old Testament, of an ancient Israelite to understand the Bible properly than a 21st century American Christian? Yeah, well, like anything, you when you are reading the Bible, like good Bible study methods, you know, just normal historical Bible study methods, we should always be first asking what was God communicating through the Holy Spirit, through the people he used to write the scriptures? What was he communicating to them in their world, in their culture, in their worldview? Because God would want to clearly communicate to people in their worldview understanding wherever they were in whatever time period. So, of course, whenever you open up the early books, I mean, the, uh, the first couple books of the Bible, we need to put ourselves as close as we can into the ancient Near East world, the ancient Israelites mindset and worldview, because that's the worldview that God was communicating to, not our worldview today. So the questions they would have are, of course, going to be different than the questions we have in our modern world. And that's the primary way the Bible kind of gets misunderstood is not realizing the importance of doing that. In fact, I love what you have in the book. And again, friends, you really need to get this. I, I, you know, I, I, I recommend books a lot, but I really recommend this book. In fact, I've, I've endorsed this book as many others have, How Not to Read the Bible by Dan Kimball. I love what you say in here, Dan, uh, before we get to some of the memes that you, you actually have in the book and answer I do want to talk about Genesis 1 for just a second, because mm -hmm. what you put in here is in very insightful uh, in the section where you talk about what are the questions that Israelites who just escaped slavery in Egypt are asking about creation. They're not asking right about how old the universe is or whether creation or evolution is true or these kind of things. What, what are the questions they're asking? Right. All right. So picture... In our world today, like we jump into thinking of the creation story and God creating the universe and the world and the six days of creation and all of that, we start looking at the Bible immediately wanting to answer our questions. What about the fossil layers? How old is the earth? You know, it's just all is the Big Bang theory, right? Those those are those those questions would not even be in the mindset of all of the ancient Israelites. So you have to go back and say, what was their worldview and what was God wanting them to know? So context is everything in the storyline of the Bible. The Israelites were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years in a polytheistic culture where the Egyptians worshipped all types of different gods, goddesses and animals and all of those things, the stars and the moon. And, so, and there was no written scripture at that time. Like we have to remember it was uh, by word of mouth, and the understanding of God was limited because there was no yet scriptures in place. So the ancient Israelites, they're leaving, uh, they leave Egypt, they're out in the desert for all of these years, and their questions aren't about the fossil record and DNA record and all of those things and dinosaurs. They're asking questions like, are we going to survive here in the desert? Are we safe here? You know, is there really only one God? We thought there was, you know, the Egyptians say there was many. Is there one? Uh, are the gods of Egypt going to be angry that we left? Is the God that, is, that Moses is telling us about more powerful than those other gods? You know, should we worship the sun or are we worshiping Yahweh, the one true God? Right. And so all of these were their questions, not about the age of the earth or the scientific, you know, questions that we may have today. And that's really, really important. Or we go on so many side tangents about the, the early chapters of Genesis. Yeah, you write that the Bible is written for us. It's not written to us. It was written to the people who, at the time the Bible was written, say the Old Testament, when Moses was around and writing the first five books, it was written to them. It is written for us, but it was written to them. So that makes a big difference. And I love what you put in there about the... Uh, Egyptian creation story. Can you just mention that briefly, what the Egyptian creation story was and how the Bible was really a polemic or a response to the Egyptian creation story, the Bible Genesis account? Yep. Uh, and the, the phrase, the Bible was written, uh, you know, for us, not to us. That's Dr. John Walton from Wheaton College who uses that. And his point and our point is like going into that world, what you just said, 
the the Egyptian worldview was that they had, you know, the god, the sun god, and the different gods and goddesses that framed the earth and created people. Uh, and, and the people were like slaves, and these gods were distant, and it was a whole different understanding. But the the Israelites highly probably would have known that worldview entirely. So God was using that story and then reframing it to say, this is about the true God, not those gods. And he used what they would have been familiar with to tell the true story that was then uh, over overcoming all, all of those uh, false stories about wrong gods that, that they believed in. You know, it's the same thing. The ten, When you look at why did God choose the uh, the 10 plagues, the 10 plagues against Egypt were not just uh, miracles, which he did. They were against specific Egyptian gods to show that those were false gods. And there is one true God, Yahweh, over all of them. And once you start understanding that Genesis just unfolds into an amazing story. And some of the questions we get so caught up on weren't the point of why God was writing it to the Israelites. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, so many, as you mentioned, of the plagues, and this is some of the work that John Currid has done, who's an archaeologist. He actually lives here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I am. Uh, he looked into the plagues, and he, what you just said is spot on, Dan. He said, for example, you know, they worship the sun in, in, in Egypt. So what does God do? He darkens the sun. Uh, they worship the Nile. What does he do? He turns it to blood, right? They worship yep. Pharaoh, who's supposed to be divine. So he takes out the firstborn, Pharaoh's son. I mean, these are things that they worship. And so it shows that Moses knew the culture of ancient Egypt. And God obviously was responding and saying, I'm the true God, not Ra, not the Nile, not uh, frogs, not whoever else you worship. I'm the true God. So this is so insightful when you really know the history the Bible makes a lot more sense. Now, we have several memes that you cover in the book. In fact, you print some of these memes that atheists put out to try and get people to say, I shouldn't believe the Bible at all. Here's one of the memes. I don't know if we can put that up, Jorge, about unicorns. Do we have that? Can we put that up? I don't know if we can do it right now. Here it there is. There you go. Unicorns, unicorns are mentioned nine times in the Bible. Cats are, cats are mentioned zero times. That's because cats are demonic, ladies and gentlemen. And that's all you need to know about the Bible. Okay. Before you send me letters, I'm just joking. I love cats. They taste like yeah. chicken. All right. So, Dan, what do we do about <laughs> what do we do about unicorns? Does the Bible really teach there are unicorns? Well, here, here's you type in unicorn and Bible on a Google search in the image and you will see a bunch of memes popping up that quotes Isaiah and other passages with the word unicorn in it. Uh, I've, I've shared the story when we talked last time about how my dent, my, my dentist, my uh, hair, my barber, who is not a Christian. And he asked me this question once. He's like, are there unicorns in the Bible? I've been seeing online there's Bible verses with unicorns. So memes like that or a meme with an image of a unicorn and an actual Bible verse underneath it that includes the words unicorn at a surface glance, those those look very they're real. There's a Bible verse, the word unicorn. In fact, there's eight or nine Bible verses with the word unicorn in it. So my barber then starts thinking, you Christians are really silly. I can't believe you believe in unicorns. Of course, like who who wouldn't think that? However, what you have to do is stop, say, is that true? What's going on? What's happening in the text or in the Bible story? And in this case, it's an easy one because in 1611, the King James translation took a word, a Hebrew word that they didn't know how to put into English. And it was talking about a one horn prominent, uh, a prominent horn on some sort of animal. And then they translated that into the English word unicorn. And so because they didn't know what else to translate it in at that time. Today, it's translated into the, the English world words wild oxen because there were wild oxen at that time that had prominent horns. And that's probably what they're talking about, not the mythical unicorn as we think of it today through that English word. So that's kind of an easy one because it's simply yeah. a mistranslation. But here's what happens, right? Time and time again, this is what's going on that you'll see over and over and over memes, Bible verses being pulled out 
images attached to actual Bible verses, and then people saying, like, look how crazy these Christians are for believing these mythical, silly things that are in the Bible. I can't believe you're a Christian. And if you're uh, maybe a younger Christian or you've never looked into it, it can catch you off guard and then start having you wondering, is your faith valid? Is the Bible really trustworthy? Mm-hmm. And that's what's, that's just repetitive so much. See, everyone, I told you there are unicorns. Come on. The Bible says there are. <laughs> It'd actually be fun if there were, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, no unicorns. All right, uh, let's do another meme. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get to your questions a little bit later. So if you want to ask a question of Dan Kimball in his book, How Not to Read the Bible, just type uh, in the chat big the big block letter question. Type question in big block letters and then put your question there. Try and keep it short, either on YouTube or on the Facebook stream there. Uh, how about this one about uh, this next one here is about women being silent. This is a little bit more... Uh, serious, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, the woman should keep quiet in the meetings. They are not allowed to speak, as the Jewish law says. They must they must not be in, in uh, charge if they want to find, this is a paraphrase, obviously, if they want to find out about something, they should ask their husbands at home. It is a disgraceful thing for a woman to speak in the church. What's the deal with this, Dan? All right, well, um, Frank, there we go. Women should not be... St- Think that there's the scriptures. It clearly says women be silent, submit, don't speak in the church, and go home and ask your husbands. It's a disgrace for right. a woman to speak, right? You read that, it's a Bible verse. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm 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 a woman or a man, anyone that's looking at it from the outside and just says, that is so horrible, right? And it's a Bible verse. So what do you do? What's, what should we be doing as Christians looking at, or anybody, if you want to know what the Bible says, who was that letter written to, right? It was written to the Corinthian church. It was written to a specific church in a specific time period in a specific culture. So we can't go reading in our own cultural understanding of today and then say, like, ah, I'm going to interpret it through a modern lens. you got to go back and look at what was going on there. And uh, the best we understand is that there's two primary ways you could probably understand that. One is that in a Jew, I mean, you probably know this, and if somebody have ever been in an Orthodox Jewish world, uh, you'll see that even in synagogues, they still divide men and women because they culturally the back wall. then. Yeah, yeah right, the Western, Western Wall, right exactly. Now. Yeah, yeah it's the, like, left, just, the left side is the man side, the right side is the woman's side. Yeah. yeah, and now they've opened up the controversial mixed side. Do you remember that? There's a third part of the wall. Oh, they're I did opening not know up. That. There's yeah, a, oh. there's a whole bunch of controversy about it, but they're, they're opening up a little all, part. all sorts of stuff up against the wall now, huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, and that's. But there you go. It's uh, so one one thought because we're not in that world. If I got this letter at the time, this is really important. If I was in the Corinthian church and I'm getting this letter from Paul, I would know exactly what he's talking about. I'd be like, of course, right? 2,000 years later, we're trying to make sense of a letter that was written to a specific church dealing with specific problems with specific people and women in that case. So we have to always remember that or we'll, or we'll just we'll miss the whole um, you know, potential of understanding what it really is. So going back to that world, one thought is that it could have been that they were still used to the separate seating. I think it was N.T. Wright, the, uh, mm-hmm. the Bible scholar, who mentioned this one as a possibility. And he said if they were used to being separate, could they have been yelling things out more? Could they have been in a different, you know, like one part of the room to the other? Were they still doing that? And so there was chatter and disrespect going on because it was a new format. That's one thought about it. Here's I'm going to read. A, I want to read something so I can articulate it clearly. Uh, Scott McKnight wrote about this in, uh, he says that Paul's comments about these silence that are normally cons- consistent, women who have been gifted by God to speak and leads God people during those in, in Paul's churches. He said that women at that time, because of their uh, place in culture and society, had not yet learned the Bible or theology And they had not yet been learning how to live a Christian life. So in that culture, it wasn't just with Christians. Women were then not going into teaching roles at that time until they had learned Orthodox theology. I'm reading what Scott wrote. So what is going on here is a principle 
of church tradition that ended up happening and, and how people were learning that we don't understand today, but it would have been out of place for women to be speaking up until they were more uh, um, learned and ready mm-hmm. to then involve in the conversation. So the whole thing becomes a cultural issue and it's not some sort of demeaning thing to women. That would have happened in any setting back then in how men and women would have been learning together. There's some other thoughts. It could have been some uh, women who were uh, worshiping the god, uh, goddess Ar- Artemis and were used to different types of things and trying to disrupt the meetings. There's some different thoughts. We don't know for sure, but there's such probable reasons. And here's the other thing. Paul could not have meant to be silent because three chapters earlier, he's telling them in the same letter to be prophesying and to be praying in the gathering. So he mm-hmm. couldn't have meant women be silent at all times. So to take that little verse and pop it out and put a nice meme on it with the women with their mouth taped shut, of course it looks horrible. But when you step back and look at what's going on, that's where it's it's mis it's misrepresenting what's going on with the scriptures there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it certainly makes a good meme. No, it does. I want to make a couple quick points. Dan, that light behind you, can you shut that off right behind oh, you? Uh, all the way in the back? Yes. Okay. Oh, I see yeah. it. Yeah. It just keeps uh, coming in and out. I don't know if you can pop that off. Anyway. Uh, I, I have to get up and I'll, I'll keep my head here for now. Okay. <laughs> I'll move my hair like right there. <laughs> That's right. When you do it, you go, it just pops in. It's mm-hmm. like a, it's like the star of David right behind you anyway, or okay. the star of Bethlehem. Uh, but anyway, a couple of things, and you make this point in the book, quoting our mutual friend, Greg Kokel, never read a Bible verse, right? Yes. Because yes. you've got to read around it. And I like to put it this way, too. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no right. verses in the Bible. The verse right. chapter verse divisions were put in 500 years ago to help us navigate the text. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can just take it out and make it say whatever we want. And that's where a lot of the trouble comes in. Um, One other thing, too, I think that's important uh, about the epistles, as you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, that's an epistle to a particular church. Uh, It's almost like as uh, uh, Gordon Fee and the other gentleman that wrote, um, uh, what's the name of the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, they say, whenever you're reading an epistle, particularly one to a particular church, it's almost like listening to one side of a telephone conversation, right? you know, because you're only hearing one side. Paul may be addressing issues that that church knows about that the readers today, us, we don't know about, but the people that got the letter would have. And so sometimes it can be difficult to figure out what's going on. But quite yeah, obviously, yeah. it did not mean what that meme seems to indicate that women should be silent in the church. Right. But again, it's it certainly is makes a nice meme and graphic and can confuse yeah. people if that's all they're seeing. You know, that's right. Uh, and what you said, like, you know, read earlier in First Corinthians, Corinthians, they were dealing with all kinds of problems that were going on in the church. So it was a group of people like a local church today that has problems going on that a letter from someone that knew them was addressing. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to make sense of it 2000 years later with things that we're not fully aware of. But there's but obviously, it's not saying what you when you read the verse by itself. I, I've heard this response. Um, well, but Jesus quoted Bible verses, right? And so why why can't we just quote a Bible verse? Uh, but going back in that world, you then will see that when anybody was quoting Bible verses, it was like a song. You'd say the first part of the chorus, and they would know the section of scripture because they had memorized chunks of scripture. So simply by quoting, you know, the beginning of Psalm 22 or something, they would have known the rest of the Psalm. So you can't even, uh, you know, because I've heard that criticism. Well, Jesus quoted Bible verses. Why shouldn't we today? And their understanding of scripture was so different in how they used it back then in the memory, uh, memorization of it. And one of the problems we have, I think, in modern day America is we're so impatient because everything's at our fingertips. We don't have the stamina or desire to sit down and really work through an issue. We want everything immediately, and we want snap judgments and soundbite answers to everything. And some things are more complicated than that. In fact, many things are more complicated than that. Uh, Many of the videos that we have on our YouTube channel from college campus events, you know, when somebody gets up to to the microphone and wants to ask a question, I'll give a two or three minute answer. 
And I'll see people in the comments saying, well, you didn't address this and you didn't address this. And you, well, of course I didn't. I had two minutes, man. I could just give you a, a little snippet of an answer. You need more time to work out the details on something as difficult as discovering what somebody meant 2,000 years ago in a letter to a particular church. And that's why Bible study takes some time and effort, and too many people don't have the patience for that. And yet, so they, they yank stuff out of context and throw it up on the Internet, and everyone's supposed to go, oh, yeah, the Bible's false then. No, that's that's not the way yeah. it really works. Well, and I, and I do think that uh, the church is partly to blame for this. Um, oh, yeah. Because, you say that. You know, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, overall, when you look at how we have been educated, I mean, I don't want to say all churches. Some churches have been super and great and teaching Bible study methods really well and not not guilty of this. But even though I know in my history, I've been guilty of this. So I know churches do do this where uh, we will use Bible verses and we use the good ones. You know, we'll pull out the nice verses and focus on them or the nice stories. You know, coffee mugs and Christian stores will have you know, things like be still and know that I'm God. And, and we mm -hmm. focus on so much of the nice parts, and yet we will still extract verses that we like and then not look at our own verses in context. So very often, I've been in sermons and, and watched someone teach from a verse, and, told, and it's been a good message, but they're totally not teaching what the verse was really about. Uh, and, and it's like, OK, they're not teaching anything in, you know, wrong in life practice, but that was not what the, what the intent of the scripture verse was. And so we've been doing it with all the happy verses and pulling them out and often misusing them. And now what's going on is that now the, the not so happy and, you know, evil even sounding Bible verses can be pulled out and it's catching people off guard because we've not we've not been taught overall how to right. study the bible correctly so it's kind of our fault in churches when we just haven't demonstrated this well well um here's a verse section of verses that does sound pretty pretty violent pretty bad let's put the next one up here this has to do with uh, killing people this is from first samuel 15 do not spare them put to death <laughs> men women <clears throat> children infants cattle and sheep camels and donkeys love god that's the meme, Dan. What do you say to this one? All right, yeah. Again, I'm I'm watching. If I'm, if I'm just seeing this meme again, I'm reading that it's a Bible verse. Then you know the sarcastic love God. You know, like you you stupid Christians for for believing in this God. And here you are, though. You can't argue away. This is not like uh, the unicorn where it's just wrong words that are put in. This is what it actually says mm -hmm. that. God gave instruction to kill women and children, right? Now, in the book, and as we've talked about before, like this is the most difficult thing to respond to fully, you know. So I will say like this is the most difficult one for me to personally ever answer. But what I can say is there's so many ways to respond to this. So it isn't just an arbitrary ruthless God just striking out and saying, kill infants and children, and that's in his character. Um, so what you always have to do is say, what's going on in the story and what's happening? And you, know, you can spend an hour just on this. Here's what I know. When you see God instructing the death of people, it is like a surgery being done. Something is going on that is really evil, you know, and I've heard you teach about it, you know, and you'll see the, there are people groups that were rate, that were worshiping uh, a god that they would put little babies in. They're they're hot, um, you know. They'd heat up the metal and horribly mm -hmm. cook, you know, babies in a horrible thing and have the drums banging so that they'd uh, have the sounds scream the sounds of their screams out. I mean, just some horrific practices, did really cr crazy sexual rights and all kinds of stuff. And what you'll then see is God at times. After warning them again and again and again, like, um, and they heard of this God, they all had times of escape uh, to escape that had times like we'll see of Rahab, where she heard about the Israelites and she then wanted to believe in the God of the Israelites. So she was spared and her family. Um, you'll see Nineveh was a city that was detestable and they were actually hanging dead people's heads their skins on the walls of the city. They were in extremely violent. 
when they heard of God who was going to come in and dis- and, and destroy and attack them, they repented at that time period. So God is always warning and begging people to please change their mind. However, at some times, he then will intervene and say, I've been patient and patient, and then he has to then take action, and there are people that are killed, just like in any military battle that goes on in the world today. And back then, it was so barbaric. But here's something else, again, and I'd love to even hear your input, because I know you've studied this so well, is that it wasn't barbaric, it wasn't race-based, it wasn't just a slaughter. In fact, Paul Capan has some great studies that actually included a chart of his in the book, where you'll see that it wasn't a slaughter of everybody, because right afterwards you would see a part of those people groups that were still living on. So there's kind of a a hyperbolic language of, you know, like we said, like we're going to slaughter them, but it wasn't talking about actually killing everybody. It was precise military strikes and certain things that were going on. So again, um, it's a very short answer to a very long, uh, uh, big question, But what you'll see is it's not just as easy to put up a meme and say, look, God kills babies and children. Look at that God. Yeah, you see people saying, oh, this is genocide. No, it's not genocide. Why? Because God did the same thing to Israel on several occasions. Yes. For example, when when the golden calf is worshipped, 3,000 people, he said, kill them. Why? Because they had violated God's law. And look, if there is a God, and there is, Uh, then God can kill people whenever he wants. And people don't die, they just change location. They go from this life to the next life, and God can bring people into the next life whenever he wants, at two years old, 82 years old, whenever he wants. And when people bring this up on a college campus, it comes up a lot, as you know, Dan, for good reason. I mean, you read that, you go, what's going on here? I often point out that, first of all, if you're an atheist, you have no grounds by which to judge this as wrong, because you have no objective moral standard. We're just a bunch of molecular machines bumping into one another. Why is it wrong to kill any, any of them? There's no purpose to life. There's no right or wrong. So there's no way an atheist can have an adequate standard by which to judge this wrong. But it is an issue for our worldview. And um, I see people claiming Uh, on a college campus. If there is a good God, why doesn't he stop evil? And here in this instance, God is stopping evil by taking out people who are literally worshiping idols and sacrificing them on molten hot, the molten hot metal idol Molech. He sit there, they're sizzling their children and God steps in and he says, okay, that's it. This needs to end after 400 years. Finally, it's going to end. And now atheists are complaining about it when God does step in to stop evil. So look, you can't have it both ways. You can't no. say that God should stop evil. And when he doesn't, you're mad. And then when he does stop evil like this, you're mad that he's done that. So, and right. as you say, there's a lot more nuance to this. Your book, How Not to Read the Bible goes into it. So does Paul Copan's book. You mentioned him. is got a moral monster. Um, if you want a question for Dan Kimball, we're going to get to questions here soon. we got a couple more memes to go through. Type the word yeah. question in big block letters and then a- ask a question in the YouTube chat or the Facebook chat and we'll try and get to it. Let's go to the next meme if we can. This uh, is about slavery. God says it's okay to buy slaves. According to Leviticus 25, you may purchase male and female slaves. What's going on with that, Dan Kimball? Yeah, same. All right. I'll, I'm being redundant, but it's the same thing of how not to study the Bible. We have uh-huh. to understand basic Bible study methods. I got to read this one verse about God and violence, because um, when when we think of God, the character of who he is is so important in knowing him over the entire Bible storyline. You know, it's like if somebody was to follow us around and only look at certain little things that we do and then piece our character over just certain pull pull elements of our life, mm-hmm. you could mm-hmm. paint someone in a, tar- in a horrible way, uh, everybody. And what when you see critics that are raising things up and then pulling them off in little memes and verses, they're not looking at verses like this in the Old Testament. You know, and this is this is the God that we we love and we worship. And he says, I take no pleasure in the, in the death of the wicked. This is from Ezekiel chapter 33. And he says, but rather they turn from their ways and live. And listen to him begging, turn, turn from your evil ways. Like, why will you die? So you see, like God 
asking people, please, I take no pleasure in this, and giving people time to respond. And that's the God that you trust, and that's not a maniac, that's not somebody that's un, that's heartless or just vicious and cruel. And, uh, you know, and that's when you, if you only look at certain things, you don't see the loving, compassionate, forgiving God over all of the Bible. Like, you know, that should be a meme right there. Like, why don't they, <laughs> let's pull that up yeah. and make a meme with that verse about God begging people to please turn from their wicked ways. Uh, and he takes no pleasure in that. So back to, back to slavery. Um, you know, it's, again, uh, there's, there was a billboard, I believe, that was... I, I, I keep thinking it was down in like North Carolina or South Carolina or somewhere where they took a, a horrible image of someone in chains and, and then they put it up with a new Testament Bible verse, you know, and it says slaves obey your masters. And it's a, a common criticism, understandably so, um, understandably so seeing Bible verses that talk about slavery and then say, I can't believe you Christians and this Bible is endorsing slavery. How do you answer that? You got all right. There's verses in the Old Testament. That's where you look first, and you got to go into that world, like I keep saying over and over and over again, and say what was going on. It was a barbaric world. There was no social security or Medicare or, you know, or, or any type of systems to care for people. And so what was happening was slavery was different than we think of it because when you look back into the Old Testament. You'll find verses that talk about kidnapping slavery is under the penalty of death, right? So we see kidnapping against your will slavery, it says, is under the penalty of death. We see that uh, not about the penalty of death, but we see the same thing emphasized in the New Testament about slave traders being seen as evil sinners. So what's going on? Study that world and you'll see it was custom at that time to sell yourself into a serving as like you would hire, like someone's working on our house today. They're putting on a roof all day long. We hire someone and they come into, uh, you know, for monetary reasons to then do a service for us and be fixing our roof. In that world, it wasn't quite as simple as that because sometimes it was for years and years and years and they even seen it as a purchasing of a person, but it was for serving a family. And then you see God working in that system to then make sure that they were cared for better. Now, again, this is really, really cr critical. All right, I, I, I keep trying to, there's so much to say about each one of these. Mm -hmm. um, but each, when you look at something like this, what you'll then see is God didn't start this. This is what he inherited. Um, you see God saying, I hate divorce. But he also enabled divorce to happen in a proper way because of human hearts not being right. Uh, and so when you go back then, God did not create servanthood or this type of or this type of bondage, slavery or anything, anything of that sort. That was human institutes that we created that then God was trying to help make it more humane. That's what you see consistent in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's the same thing, but even it's different. It's a whole different world now. Now we're not down in ancient Israelite world, and, and now we're up into Rome and Greece, where you'd see slaves, and that's what they're talking about in the New Testament. And that was an entirely different slavery. It was not race-based. It was fellow Greeks and Romans. There were doctors and lawyers that would be seen as slaves. And they would go into the household. And I was reading somewhere that it was like about a third, to even a half of Roman could have been slaves. It was mm -hmm. their entire system of how they worked at that time. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, but now this was, right, I, I should have started with this. When we think of slaves, we instantly think of the evil, wicked uh, kidnapping of Africans and bringing them over to Americans as slaves. The Bible explicitly condemns that, like, it condemns that, and it was wrong, and when people use the Bible to justify slavery, they were not putting into the principles the same stuff I'm talking about now. They're pulling out Bible verses and misusing them out of their context. So we have to always go back into that world to understand it more. And then you'll see Christians who were at the forefront of changing the world of slavery and forcing things through to make change and freeing people. And when Christ came and Paul talked, about in Galatians, he was breaking everything down. There was no more, everybody was equal. 
there was value put into who was a slave or who wasn't, and it just turned everything upside down. I'm, I'm, I'm I could, all right, I'm done. Well, you could check it, check the book out because you go into yeah. a lot of depth in the book how not to read the Bible, and that is so important, Dan, because as you say, people when they see the word slave, they think of the kind of slavery we had here 150, 160 years ago. It's not the case. Yeah. In fact, the NIV now has started using the proper word servant, which is yes. really going on, servant. And one of the problems is, is that the Hebrew word for, for worker can mean worker, can mean servant, can mean slave. It can mean so many different things. And uh, so that's part of the confusion there. If the uh, Americans 160 years ago obeyed both the Old and the New Testaments, the kind of slavery we had in America never would have happened. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. It was against so, the teachings of Jesus and right. the scriptures. Exactly. Um, all right. We got another meme. Uh, this one has to do with biblical marriage. I believe in biblical marriage, Dan. Look, in the Bible, you got man with multiple <laughs> wives. You got man with concubines. You got a man with his brother's <laughs> wife, a man, a woman he rapes, and, and men and women he captures in war and all this. But I, I thought biblical marriage was one man, one woman. What's going on here? Yep. Again, I, uh, I, I'm laughing every time I see these because, man, if I saw these and it's quoting, I'd be like, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not. That, that's a wacky book. Um, and uh -huh. Again, same thing. Um, how do you study the Bible? What's going on in that world? One, I can say this, you know, throughout the entire New, Old Testament and New Testament, you never see any of those in that list uh, defining what marriage was supposed to be. Every single one of those were when human beings went outside of the original creation and the original design, and then they were uh, in, you know, developing different forms of marriage and whether it's polygamy and all the stuff about men and multiple wives and all of these things ended up being human things going against the original plan. You don't see God saying that is what you're supposed to do. Now, heroes, this is a you know it's an interesting thing to think about. You know, you'll see. You always hear about Solomon and his many wives, but you have Abraham and David and was it Jacob and others that had multiple wives. That was the app. That was the average way people lived back then. It, but it is never a, a a command from Scripture or something you see God endorsing. So you can't go and say, you know, what was biblical marriage? Go back to Genesis. What did what did Jesus do when he was asked about marriage? He's like, don't you know? In the beginning, and he went back to Genesis and said. That is the way God planned it. Human beings then change things later on to all of that list. That is not biblical. It's, it's, it's biblical marriage in the way that, yes, people did that in the Bible, but that's not biblically endorsed marriage by God and his spirit writing what it should be. Yeah, it makes fact, a great a meme, of, though. It makes yeah, a great a lot meme. Of people think that, yeah, a lot of people think that everything described in the Bible is prescribed in the Bible. Yes. And that's not the case. There's a lot of description. You know, it describes David committing adultery with Bathsheba, but that doesn't mean that God wants us to go commit adultery. Quite obviously, that's not the case. So people are always confusing prescriptions and descriptions. Also, the Bible does speak against polygamy in Deuteronomy 17, 17, I think it is. It says, don't multiply wives. Um and as you point out in the book, every time somebody did get involved in polygamy, it never worked out, right? <laughs> right. In, in fact, Abraham taking Hagar as his concubine, actually, you, you, you know, I, I know you know this, Dan, but our, our viewers, Muslims trace their father back to Abraham, but through Ishmael, not mm -hmm. Isaac. Mm -hmm. The split, and you know, Islam started in about 632 A.D., when, when Muhammad died, uh, so it's much later than the New Testament, but they trace their lineage back to Ishmael, not Isaac, and they mm -hmm. think that God took, or that uh, um, Abraham took Ishmael up to be sacrificed, when of course it was Isaac, and of course that was just a, a foreshadowing of God taking his son Jesus to the same hill, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, although when he took Jesus to that same hill, he went through with the sacrifice that saves all of us. But in any event, uh, the book is fabulous, and there are many more, uh, many more scriptures and memes that you go into uh, in the book, Dan, that people should really get it. And I know you've said this before, 
if somebody really can't afford to get the book, you'll figure out a way to get to them because you want them to have the book. So if you yep. can't afford the book. Uh, yeah, I will to send anybody that wants one that can't afford one. I mean, I'm buying it myself, but I will send it to them for anyone that, that would want them. Because see, the reason I'm doing this, another reason you do this too, it's not just like Bible trivia here or like, let's try to problem solve this stuff. The reason we're talking about this is that there are lives that are being impacted to right. either follow Jesus or reject him, trust in the God of the Bible, or turn to other gods or other things in this world. And that's why this is so serious. And, um, and I would want to encourage like grandparents, parents, like you don't have to become Bible experts, but proactively just become aware of how to respond to some of these things. Because what I keep hearing is when kids ask their parents, they're so caught off guard and they see that. And you don't have to, again, you don't have to become experts, but this is, it's more than just Bible trivia here. Like it's a generation and all ages that is now um, having a misunderstanding of who God is by things that aren't true. Yet mm -hmm. they seem like they're true because they're pulling Bible verses out. And because of the internet, it's spreading everywhere. And that's what this is about. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. Bible facts and trivia and interesting cultural things that we can decipher. It's about lives that need Jesus and are being mis mistaught and mis mm -hmm. uh, misled. And, and we have to be aggressive to try to put something out to say that's not true about our God and about Jesus and about the Bible. And if you notice, the memes that we covered tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as I say, there are many more in the book. Um, we've covered five of them. Unicorns, women be silent, kill people, slavery, and biblical marriage. Four of those five memes that we covered today have to do with morality, right? We all think that if we just read those passages out of context, the God of the Bible seems immoral, right? Again, my question to atheists is, if there is no God, why is anything right or wrong? There is no objective morality. You have to steal from God to argue against him. You have to say that these things in the Bible are immoral, yet you have no standard by which to do that if there is no God. Now, I agree with you that on the face of it, they seem problematic morally, but as you pointed out, Dan, once you get closer and you really use the proper methods to understand what's going on in the text, you realize that the issues, the problems evaporate with a proper understanding of what's going on, a proper understanding of the culture. Now, uh, that, was, that was going on when the Bible was being written. Let's go to some questions from our audience now. And if you, again, want to write a question or ask a question, just type question in big block letters in any of the streams and we'll try and get to it. Here's the great Jorge Gill. Jorge, what questions do we have for Dan? What's going on, gentlemen? I got one here by Kirk Otto. He asked, why would God allow specific verses to apply only to that specific culture? I mean, it's um, when you're when you're writing to any specific person or in any world, you're going to write uh, something so that they would understand it in their world. You know, just like back at that time, they were dealing with things that we weren't. So we weren't dealing with what the Canaanites were worshiping and those type of gods. So God was instructing them about things they were dealing with in their time period that would make sense to them. And, and so that was just that's just what you would do when you're writing to a specific person in a time period in a specific culture. Great. I got to actually want to thank Kendall Barrow for the uh, stars on uh, Facebook. And he, he has a question. He says, can you discuss the imp importance of also reading the Bible literally? And he says, no, I don't mean actually, but within the many different literary types and devices within the Unified Bible. And what I think he means is, a lot of people I will ask you, do you take the Bible literally? What do we mean by that when we say, hey, we, we take the Bible literally, but what different types of um, uh, types lit, uh, literary types are within the Bible and why we should look into these every time we're looking at a biblical verse or a chapter? Yep. I mean, again, basic Bible study methods would just say uh, the Bible... 100% inspired by God. Everything in the original is exactly what God wanted to stab. So that's my premise that you start with. But then God used poetry. He used historical literature. He used law. He used historical uh, narrative. He used different genres and metaphors to communicate, just like we would today. So you take the whole thing literally in terms of that the literal word of God is 100% from him. 
but you need to look at genre and and to understand it the best. That's just practical Bible study methods. When Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, he didn't mean he was an actual loaf of bread. You don't take that literally. He was using a phrase to make a point. All of the Bible is literally true, but it's not always expressed literally. In fact, we don't express things literally. We might, you might say, man, we've been, I've been working all day. Well, no, you haven't. You didn't get up at 1201 and start working and you've been working till, you know, or you might say, we talk about that all the time. No, you don't. Not all the time. Are you t- that's a euphemism. That's a, yeah. an idiom. That's a way of saying something. Or as you just said, I, I like the, the, you know, Jesus is the door. It's a metaphor. He doesn't have hinges. Yeah. He doesn't have a doorknob. We have to know the type of literature to try and understand what the literature really means. We have to, to understand what the literal truth is. We have to understand how it's being expressed. And sometimes, in fact, many times, it's not being expressed literally. You know, little known fact uh, from our friend uh, Mike Heiser. He was on one of his podcasts. He says that most people, the studies have shown that most people don't go to the literal meaning of something automatically, almost reactionary. Most people will look at a metaphorical meaning first and then revert to the literal. So that's really Mm. interesting to think. And when you think about it, yes, every time somebody says something, you first try to put it in that metaphorical sense. So I I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Daryl has a question here from our YouTube channel. He says, how do we discern when a passage is cultural and when a passage is timeless? Well, I would say um, you always look at what specific book or letter in the Bible it was. Who I, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot. It's like, who was it written to? When was it written? And then there's great studies and commentaries and scholars who are there to, I mean, trusted scholars. There's a lot of scholars that like don't trust them at all. They have to have a, they have to, a, a premise of that the Bible is 100% inspired and authoritative and trustworthy. But it's... Um, there are, it, you look at what was, uh, I'm sorry, the Old Testament was written to uh, the Jewish people before Jesus. After Jesus, you then want to be looking at through that lens and say, what are the moral principles that still apply for us today? And they're pretty easy to see. So it's uh, when you look at the Bible storyline, it's fairly easy to then see what are the New Testament things to pull, uh, to continue in, in usually ethics and morals. But there are cultural things like head wearing uh, head coverings or greeting each other with a holy kiss. We don't do that today. We we hug, we shake hands, uh, but the principle continues. Though the but but it was a different culture. Frank, you might have a better. Uh, no, I, I, I like your example. Of of greet greet one another with a holy kiss. In that case, the command is universal, but not in the way that you express it. In other words, it's it's a universal command to greet people. But the relative part of it to the culture is how you do it. You know, today we don't greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, we greet one another, as you say, with a handshake or a hug or just a, fit, a you know, a fist pump or something like that. So mm-hmm. the uh, the universal behind the command is greet someone. How you do it is culturally dependent. And uh, I think there are places, though, where sometimes we don't know if it's cultural or if it's universal. Right. Uh, and th- there may be instances like that, but most of the time you can figure it out. And sometimes you need the help of people who have studied this in much more depth. And you get that through commentaries and biblical dictionaries and that kind of thing. Excellent. We got uh, actually got Christopher uh, Buckingham. He says, I am a student. How can I take you up on that offer to get your book, Dan. And and what I would say to Christopher is he can email us. The email is simple, info at crossexamine.org, and we'll send that um, information to Dan. Because I know Christopher and- is always on our live streams supporting and learning. So that, that, that'll be an, an excellent gift for him. Also, Dan's website is dankimble.com, right, Dan? Is that yep. it? Dan Kimball, K-I-M-B-A-L-L dot com. And, and pretty right. soon you're going to have a uh, curriculum that goes with this, right? Yeah, in right? January we'll have a, a youth okay. study guide, an adult study guide, videos for it, like animated videos for teachers to use, and also uh, slides with all the memes will be available for free. 
for teachers to use. I just so Fantastic. badly want people to be able to teach about this so right. that people can see how to read the Bible. You know, yeah, I was hope. actually, the, the next question I had was, what is the most effective way to teach teens in a youth group or college students to actually read the Bible or see the value in doing it to begin with? And there you go, man, dankimble.com, right? Yep. Yeah, there's so many great resources out there today. The Bible Project is a wonderful resource for teaching with the videos that are amazing. Tim Mackey and John Collins there. It's BibleProject.com. It's a trustworthy source of Bible teaching to show. I think the great way to help with youth, I wouldn't do it all the time, but put memes up and then just put them on the screen and say, how do you answer this? And then break them into groups and have them try to problem solve. Show them how to start thinking through how it how to problem solve by even putting up the memes and, and the Bible verses and say, how do you solve it? And when they have the tension of, I don't know how, then you teach them how to do it. And then they can start learning how to do it for all kinds of Bible verses. You know, it's, it's very interesting that my my 13-year-old daughter walk in and I had this slide about the slavery put up and she said, that's not how you should translate that word because I have her doing little essays oh, and stuff right. like that. <laughs> and she's she's familiar at 13. She's familiar with Copan's work. So that was yeah. that was pretty encouraging. Wonderful. Uh, I got another Christopher, the same guy asked, what's your advice for Christians at a university right now? All right, Frank, you want you want to answer that? I mean, I I've, I can say uh, my context here, but I think you were around so many yeah, universities. Yeah, well, my my first uh, two things when you get to a university. Uh, number one, try and get a Christian roommate before you get there, and number two, immediately get involved in a Christian group on campus that believes in the Bible. Not a not a one that doesn't, but a, a conservative Christian group. You need people around you to encourage you. Uh, because you're going to be pulled away from the truths of Christianity on a, on most college campuses. It's just going to be in the air. It's going to be in the water. And you're going to have to surround yourself with people who are support a support for you. Uh, and then, of course, you can get books like this, because I'm serious. This, this book, How Not to Read Your Bible, is going to be critical because so many of the things you're going to see on a college campus are some of the memes that are in here or they're going to be stated in such a way as to mock Christianity. And so you need to be really, really grounded in the faith. Of course, I'd recommend my book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, but also this book as well, Tactics by Greg Kokel. If you haven't had that book or haven't seen that book, get that book as well. Yeah, before we go to the next question, I want to thank John Whitaker. Send us 3,500 stars on Facebook. So we want to thank you for that. And these donations well, thanks, will help us to continue to do. It might be the John Whitaker here in the Charlotte area, perhaps. Perhaps. I don't know. It doesn't say. Um, right. uh, again, another question. And they, all these questions we know are going to be similar. It's related to what's what's your 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 method to do Bible reading as you go through the scriptures. Well, I will say, uh, and something actually I, I talk about in the very beginning of the book, the first section, it talks about the importance of knowing the Bible storyline, uh, and I would say I wish that this was taught from elementary age, middle school. By the time you're in high school, you could draw it out yourself, because you know when you're opening up the Bible, you're opening up, it's a story over 1,500 years, and you want to then, study methods should place you like, okay, I'm, I'm in this part now, where am I? What year am I in? What culture am I in? What 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 is God speaking to, to that specific uh, people group that this part of the Bible is written to? And to me, that's the, the most important part to start Bible study methods is that. And there are some great, again, Bible project video uh, Bible, are, are great in this study Bibles usually have that in there. I'd be, uh, but that's my most important advice is to look at the Bible storyline and and don't do what Great Greg Kokel says not to do. I'm, I'm sorry, do what he says not to do. Don't ever read a Bible verse. Um, that's my quick advice back. It is great. We actually have uh, a question that is a more. Um, related to the historicity of Moses. He says, did Moses exist as a real person? He says, I've been told some people say he didn't exist. I don't know if you guys want to touch that question. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've seen him on TV. Yeah. Uh, uh, Come on. With Charlton Heston. <laughs> Hold on, well, hold on. I, need, I need to get this. Hold on, hold on. Three, two, one. <laughs> it, Jesus believed in Moses, and therefore I believe in Moses. Jesus explicitly talked about Moses. Moses appeared with Jesus and Elijah. Like to to say he didn't exist because maybe there's not archaeological evidence with his name on it somewhere. Is, is then saying that I can't believe in Jesus either. He was deluded and believed in somebody that didn't exist. By the way, uh, I want you guys who are watching, go back to our Hope One live stream. We probably did six or seven months ago with Titus Kennedy and Stephen Meyer because we went through nine or ten lines of evidence from Egypt that suggest the Exodus took place. Okay? From Egypt. You always hear there's no evidence for the Exodus. Nonsense. Go back and watch that Hope One live stream because it's fascinating. Titus Kennedy himself is an archaeologist who went all the way to South Sudan, or uh, it might not be South Sudan, normal Sudan, back uh, three years ago to find an inscription of Yahweh, the oldest inscription ever discovered of Yahweh anywhere. And it's from 1400 B.C., and it talks about these wandering people who are worshiping Yahweh. And Titus was our guest on our program here. And when he discovered that or where he discovered that would have been southern Egypt at the time. Uh, it's the Sudan now, but it's southern Egypt at the time. That's just one piece of evidence that you had wandering people worshiping Yahweh in 1400 B.C. in Egypt. Well, hello. That's when the Exodus took place. So there's a lot of evidence that uh, the Exodus took place. And as we mentioned earlier here on this uh, live stream, the plagues of, of Exodus are literally slams on the Egyptian gods. This is known. They knew the culture. If Moses didn't write Exodus, somebody from Egypt wrote it because he knew what was going on. Excellent. We've got Jeremiah Chandler says, I teach an apologetics club at my college campus. I was wondering what material we should go over and what kind of events should we host on campus. We have read I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist and Tactics already. So what are your su oh. your suggestions? They're saved then. They don't have to worry about them. They got read those two books, right? <laughs> they got to get this one too. How not to read the Bible. I mean, I, I wrote that book with average person in mind. You know, it's taking scholarly things and putting it in very practical ways, a lot of graphics. So I think it's good for college age to read and uh, and it addresses all of these. So I hope it's helpful. And again, I, I'll, um, and, and something too, like when someone always says, well, scholars are saying, you always have to ask what scholars, because scholars today are quoted and they may, they may have an entirely different premise that they're building off of. And so, uh, you know, another thing scholars say, there's no Moses, like you have to be wondering, you know, where, what's their worldview to start that says that? Because there are many other scholars that will say the opposite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, Frank, I think we are at that time to ask Dan our last question, man. Oh, yeah, Dan, this, uh, we started this live stream right when the big lockdown started and back in like March. And we called it Hope One because we wanted to give people hope. And so we always ask our guests, uh, give us some hope. Where do we get our hope from as Christians? And where can anybody listening to us, watching us right now, can get hope? I mean, the hope is, uh, I mean, for me personally, the hope is uh, I can know the living God in his story when I start reading the scripture. And it changes everything. It changes my countenance, my worldview, my inclination to, um, you know, get depressed, uh, which I get depressed, but I mean, the hope is the living God who cares for us still, and that surpasses everything, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, pa pandemics, whether it's lock-ins, whether it's uh, cancer. I know someone that's very ill with cancer, a young woman, probably, you know, and she's, she might be listening, She, uh, you know, she's just been diagnosed, and her hope is in Jesus. She's the most faithful Jesus-loving person in the midst of a lot of 
uh, you know, sadness and difficulty. And the hope is Jesus. It sounds cliche, but it's so true. And that's what keeps that. He's who keep. He is who keeps me going through the ups and downs of life. Mm. Mm. What's her name? Can we pray for her? What's her first name? Yeah, her name's Jess. Yeah. Yes. Well, Father, we pray you'd heal Jess if it your will. If it's not your will, that you would give her comfort and give her the opportunity to share her difficulties with others so she could help others as well. But we do pray for healing. We thank you that she's a believer. We also thank you that she's a great witness, not just a believer, but a disciple, somebody who's following you. Bring people around her that will help her as well, because we're all your ambassadors. In Christ's name, we pray because he died for us. Amen. 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 Hey, friends, one other thing we got to remember, it's Christmas uh, week from tomorrow, right? Um, Jesus came into the world to take our sin upon himself. And if you haven't accepted that free gift that he provides to forgive your sins and to give you his righteousness, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you accept it? It's free. And despite the fact that there are still questions, and we all have questions, Dan has questions, I have questions that are unanswered, Christianity still explains reality the best. And you'll always have questions you don't have answers to. But that's no reason to say, I'm just going to stay out. I'm just not going to make a decision. No, not making a decision is a decision to be separated from the eternal God. Why would you do that? So as Christmas comes up, remember, he truly is the reason for the season, because without him, we're lost forever. Dan, back to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this out, brother. Yeah. Well, as I just, well, I just want to say, and I've said this before, like, I'm so grateful for your ministry and, and who you are, even from both of us coming out of New Jersey, we're about the same age and everything. And it's, uh, um, so thank, f- thank you for your friendship. And we're in this together. And I'm so grateful that you are out on college campuses and all that you're doing, because you're, you're an example of an intelligent, kind Christian who, whenever a tough question, you always empathize with the person first. And so thank you for the ministry that you have to so many people. And uh, I've been a fan for a long time. So thank you very much. Thanks. And I'm certainly a fan of your work as well. And let me just say one other quick thing before we go. If you get angry with people because they have questions about Christianity, I don't think you have the right attitude because why should people agree with you? I didn't even agree with me. If you ask me what I believed 40 years ago, I wouldn't even I wouldn't agree with what I believe now. So why should you expect everybody to agree with you, especially in our culture where there's so much deception and there's so much information thrown at people? Sometimes it's difficult to figure out what's true. Yeah, some people don't want to know what's true. I get that. But as Paul said, I was an insolent and arrogant man, yet God showed me mercy. He showed me grace. And so we have to have that attitude with people who don't believe the way we do. Why should they believe the way we do? They haven't had the same life experience. They haven't maybe uh, studied as we have, or maybe they've come to different conclusions, and maybe they think they have valid reasons for that. Okay, just let's just have a dialogue and see where see where it lands. That's what we. That's the attitude we ought to have. I think. So thanks, Dan. Thanks for this great work. Remember, DanKimble.com. DanKimble.com. There's some free stuff up there. It, I think it is the uh, is the student guide going to be free up there, Dan? Or yep. Yep, student guide, okay. teaching slides, everything will be up free in January. All right. All right. Keep an eye on dankimble.com. In the meantime, Christmas stocking stuffer right here. Trust me, it's a great book that will prevent young people from walking away needlessly mm-hmm. and even older people. So make sure you get it. Thanks, Jorge. Thanks for running this for us. Thank you, guys. All right. See you guys next time. God bless.